With an ever-increasing amount of e-mountain bikes and products on the market, we've had a ton of feedback from you guys, questions related to geometry or maintenance. So we thought it was fit to start off again with the EMBN Tech Clinic. Well, we say e-mountain bikes and products, there's also the riders. The hills and trails are simply alive with e-mountain bikers these days. But yes, uh, a ton of questions from you guys, and uh, yeah, a lot of conundrums as well, Chris, which I think people need, need answering, right? There is, that's for sure. And let's kick it off with Claire Leonard here. She's saying, hi, I love your videos, thanks very much. I'm five and a half foot. What size Orbea rides do you think would be best for me? I went to my local Orbea shop, and the standover height of a medium is too high for me, uh, and the seat on the small doesn't quite go high enough, so I'm thinking of getting a small frame with a longer dropper post, does this sound reasonable to you? I think the first thing, Claire, is that, yeah, I mean, going to a shop is definitely the best way to go about buying an E-mount, it might get the, get the size right for you. Um, let's, let's, let's cover the, seat, the actual seat and the seat dropper in a minute. Um, let's have a look at the numbers on the Orbea Rise, and I, I think actually the standover on the old bay is actually quite low. We've got like a 710 in the size small and a 736 in size medium. So if you look at the old bay rise, you know, in the context of other e-mounted bikes on the market, it's actually quite a low standover on that bike. Mm -hmm. um, what you need to bear in mind is if you do go down a size, you're gonna be maybe compromising the bike in other areas, such as maybe the reach of your bike. Maybe the bike might be a bit too cramped if you ride a small size small, and also you're gonna have the stability which you get on a size medium. That bike's gonna be a bit longer than it is on a size small. So yeah, it's not just, you know, it's not just the standard we need to worry about. So I, I'd actually go for a ride on both bikes um, and maybe try to get the shop to put that, that longer seat dropper on, mm -hmm. as, you, as you mentioned. It's a tough one, this one, Chris. It is, isn't it? There's a few ways you can obviously adjust that cockpit area. You can put a slightly longer stem on, you know, rise up, uh, different, uh, roll your bars forward a little bit, slide the saddle back. There's a few little custom bits you can do. But as you mentioned, there's loads of different seat posts uh, lengths. You know, one up actually do a 220 mil long dropper post, which is super long, would give you that extra size. But as you mentioned, you just don't want to be compromising in other areas. The reach is definitely super important, isn't it? But I think if you're perched high up on that frame and it is, you know, you feel like straddled across it is not going to be comfortable so maybe mm -hmm. going down that size but yeah tweak it and as steve says ride both those sizes and see which one suits you out on the trails for yeah. sure right next question is coming in from mike adler he says now that you have put some time in on the 2022 specialized turbo levo alloy comp do you still feel it is the sweet spot for cost conscious weekend warriors i'm looking to pick one up to do mostly trail and cross-country riding with no intentional big hits would love to get your feedback. Now, Steve, you spent a lot of time on this bike, haven't you? I have, yes. Uh, I mean, went up to uh, Northwest Scotland with Danny McCaskill. Swimming. Uh, sw swimming recently, yeah. So, in okay, let's let's break this down into 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 some component parts. You know, mm. first of all, uh, cost conscious uh, tr uh, trail warrior. Um, it's still six, seven, seven hundred fifty pounds. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, not one of the least expensive e-mounted bikes on the market. But to do the job which it's intended to do, so now the Levo uh, is one fifty, one sixty travel. Um, some of the bikes, some of the more expensive bikes, obviously come with the Fox thirty eight fork up front. But the bike, bike I've got has got a Fox thirty six, which I think is great for all round riding. And I think actually to answer the question, I think one fifty, one sixty is the sweet spot Definitely. for sure. Um, you know, you can do smoother trails, you can if you wanted to, do rougher trails. I think it's about, you know, I think the spec as it comes out of the box is bang on. You've got a good range battery um, and you've got the tyres which are, you know, the right compounds. You know, if you want to do more cross-country single track fire road, you can always change the tyres on the bike. Um, the spec is right. The chassis as well, being made out of alloy instead of carbon. Obviously, you've got that more expensive bikes coming in the carbon. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think the performance mm -hmm. on the Levo alloy is as good as the performance on the one mm -hmm. on the carbon bike. But, you know, you do get maybe it's visually different. You've got higher spec components, like mm -hmm. I mentioned, the 38 fork mm -hmm. on, on the carbon bike. 
Um, what you're gonna... I was going to say, it's highly adjustable as well, isn't it? All the flip chip on there, you've got exactly. adjustable head angle, different headset cups you can put in there. Yeah. This bike, you can do a lot of so tweaking you, with it. So you can actually, like Chris says, you can actually tweak the bike mm. for your intended riding. So mm. as an all-rounder, it's, it's a good bet. But now one thing you might want to consider is that the, um, the more expensive bikes have got the the, the Mastermind TCU on there, as opposed to the to the more basic TCU on, on the bike that you mentioned. Do you need it? Well, the question comes is, do you actually look at your display whilst you're riding? But nevertheless, one feature which, which has got on the Mastermind is the Microtune. Now, you haven't got Microtune on that bike, which is a very cool feature. It means you can, you can adjust your bike in 10% increments, so might be worth thinking about, but as an all-rounder, Chris, I think I, I think yeah. um, I think Mike, it, it's it's a banger. Yeah, definitely. if you can get one, I do actually see there's a few uh, uh, S5s and S6s on on the special website at the minute. Get one whilst it's there, then for sure. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Before we go into the next question, I do want to point out as well another good thing about the Levos is the wide range of sizing, six sizes in that mm -hmm. bike, so it might be worth considering. Uh, now, moving on now to the next question, which is from um, Joel. Des Rosier, who says, Hi, what is better between a tubeless setup and an Armour Tannis insert? Um, I'll start that off because I actually have no idea. Chris <laughs> is your man when it comes to tubeless. I mean, I love riding tubeless, but mm -hmm. what I tend to find is I'll puncture and then I'll be out on the trail and I'll put a tube in and then I won't switch it back to tubeless. You tubeless is the ultimate, isn't it? it? Is, I definitely. mean, in terms of you know, weight and, and, and you know, and pinch flats, you don't get so many, but um, yeah, what's yes. the answer, Chris? So I think the Tannis, you're on about the one with the inner tube insert. Now, the Tannis insert is definitely good. Um, still uses an inner tube in there, much like you do, Steve, occasionally. Um, but you've got, obviously, that pinch flat protection with this. And the great thing about that Tannis insert is that you can actually ride home if you get a puncher. So it's got a... It's, gives you enough stability in the tire to actually ride home. And of course, you've got no maintenance with a Tannis insert, meaning you don't have to top up your sealant, which you do with tubeless. But tubeless, for me, I think is, is the one. It makes a tire a lot more supple, gives you a lot more grip, and of course, you've got that protection. It is a little bit messy, and it does require maintenance, but out of the two, I think. Okay, right. Tubeless it's quite interesting because uh, related to the previous race, now I was out with Danny McCaskill in, in the Highlands, and he goes for these big, big rides. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a big ride, it is important to be able to get home. Yeah. And I think that inset must must be a good thing. I mean, um, yeah. There you go. Uh, that's that's Chris's feedback. And like I said, I'm. You're a tubes man, aren't you? I'm a tubes man. <laughs> yeah, but I'm an old man. Right, next question is in from Lee Van Norman. He wants to know, how do I post a picture or a video for your YouTube show? So, of course, that's the EMBN show, and it's super simple to use the uploader service. Details are up for that on screen now, and we love seeing all your content here on the show. So get involved, anything involved, you know, send it to us. And it could be you as a star of next yeah, show. Yeah, actually, do you know what? In, and in relation to this new tech clinic, guys, mm. I mean, anything comes down to the, any type of bike, motor, geometry, componentry, fixing your bikes. We want to cover it. We want to help you guys make the right decisions uh, when it comes to your e-mounted bike. Uh, Chris, moving on to the next question from Jimmy Grimshaw. Mm -hmm. uh, question for EMBN, oval chainring on EMTBs. Now, I actually rode a Biopace chainring back in the 1980s on my mm -hmm. specialized stump jumper, but uh, I haven't actually tried one since then, to no. be honest. The biggest difference here with an oval chainring on a standard bike, you've got a fixed front chainring. So that chainring is always in the same relation to your crank. And an oval chainring is designed to give you power at the half past 12 position on your cranks. But of course, on an e-bike, you've got a front free wheel and that chainring will change orientation to the cranks every revolution. So absolutely no gain in running an oval chainring on your e-mountain bike. Neil Pearson asks, why are there so few frame options? Um, Foes look like they will be the only main brand to try and sell frame and motor assembly. I rode high back from the start and want to replace my Xduro. However, with all my shiny kit, I just don't need the junk in a full build. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, this. Uh, I, you know, specialized offer, offer a bike. Um, I'd like to see more bikes on the market. I think mm -hmm. you, you can actually get Q bikes. I've got a friend in Bristol who's got 
who's just bought a cube bike and he can get a motor on that fitted. So yeah. it's a great question, Neil. I think it's a question that we need to go to, mm -hmm. to the manufacturers, actually. Yeah, I think it depends on your budget. You've got, obviously, you've got specialised with a high-end market, but if you search around on eBay and some of those sort of sites, you can get actually frames from China, from Dengfu, yeah. which don't cost a lot of money. And of course, add your own motor into that. Could be a way of getting a And also, bike. I mean, you, you do actually see a lot of people going to bike shops and they, I've seen a few people, I've gone to bike shops and say, actually, can you put my my part mm. on this bike. Right. Uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe that comes down to your local bike shop. But mm -hmm. um, um, next question is from uh, Derek Coates. What e-bike motor offers the most ground, ground clearance possible? I assume it may be the Bosch. Mm -hmm. uh, now, ground cl clearance is actually down to the geometry of the bike. Um, so I just dropped my... Now, ground clearance actually comes in several different forms. It comes down to the frame geometry of the bike, comes down to your crank length, comes down to the pedals you use, comes down to the suspension setup you've got on the bike, and also comes down to the suspension design of the bike as well. So that is an almost impossible question to ask. Mm -hmm. If it comes down to the dimensions of the motor, yeah. um, I think there's not really that much in it when it comes down to the Bosch, mm -hmm. the Bros, the Shimano, the yeah. Yamaha. Mm -hmm. What does change is actually different brands' uh, approach to the casing that goes around there. You know, yeah. some some brands have got like a, a, um, a bash guard on the mm -hmm. bike. Yeah, uh, it's a tricky one. I mean, you know, you, you could you know the bottom bracket height just as one example. You know, some bikes a, a good bottom bracket height for me is going to be about, you know, 345, whereas you see some bikes got like a 360 bottom bracket. Mm -hmm. Some bikes have even got like a 335 middle bottom bracket. Yeah. So, so that's probably the most important thing to think about when mm -hmm. it comes down to, to clearance, would you say, Chris? Yeah, I think so. And also, if you're talking about pedal strikes as well, you can also swap out your crank length. We're seeing a lot of e-bike manufacturers actually go down to 160 mil over like the 170 or 175 of the old school kind of uh, style of cranks, giving that bit more ground clearance. So Yeah, but it comes down to technique at the, mm -hmm. end, of the end of the day. It's mm -hmm. your riding technique, which matters. I've ridden bikes with 330 bottom brackets and uh, yeah, you've just got to be get your timing right. Mm -hmm. But folks, we've actually got a video on cranks coming up on the channel very soon, so don't get to tune in. Uh, now, Derek uh, Dupale, uh, is asking, I have a giant rain e-bike, it's okay to charge. Is it, is it okay to charge when it's 50% battery or do I have to let it go down to 0%? Mm -hmm. um, I think all bikes, I think you're okay to go down to 0% on an e-bike because the battery management system on most e-bikes now will, you know, you know it, it, even though it discharges at 0%, they, most of the time there will be probably 10 or 20% left in the battery. but. The, the BMS probably won't let you know there's that much in there. Mm. But 50%, Chris, what would you say to that? Yeah, it depends on when you're using it next. If you're going out for a ride the next day, then yeah, bang it up to 100% charge. But if you're going to be storing it, even just for a couple of weeks without riding it, just let it down to about 60%. That way it's just going to keep your battery in the best health it can be. And one final question, folks, albeit a slightly complex one, is the whole business about restrictions on e-mountain bikes. Now, obviously, in Europe, it's 25 kilometers an hour, and in the US, it's 32. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, we uh, rode a 32K bike recently, and I think if you're using an e-mountain bike on the road, then 32 is better. If you're using mm -hmm. it on flat trails, it's better. But at the same time, if that's the only riding you're doing, probably go for a road bike, right? Definitely. But uh, the question is from Celion9998. My question is, has there been or is there any current effort to propose a change of laws regarding the speed limit for license-free e-bikes in Europe, like raising it to 30 or 32 kph within the EU or the UK? Was this ever proposed by someone at all, or is this considered a futile undertaking? I think there needs to be a lobby for 32K myself. Yeah, I think there's been lots of petitions actually about sorting this out, and uh, it'd be great to see that put in place, I think. And I think it's weird that electric bikes are the only electric vehicles to be governed by speed. I mean, we see the likes of Tesla, you know, doing cars that can do nearly 200 miles per hour. Why aren't they limited to 70 miles per hour like they are, you know, on our UK motorway and things like that? It's, yeah, it's an odd one. I think, it? you know, I think the main thing is that we do need to be careful mm -hmm. of, of our trails. And, and we, I think on EMB, and we certainly don't want to see people tearing around trails on, uh, you know, de-restricted mm -hmm. bikes, doing like 60 mile an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe bringing conflict like, there. 
geofence in so it knows where you are on your bike and will adjust the bike to suit the speed of the area you're riding in. Maybe that's something we'll see coming into tech. I think that's a bit over my head, that one, Chris. <laughs> uh, folks, thanks so much for your first round of questions on the new EMBN Tech Clinic. Uh, keep them coming. I think I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, get I involved in the comments box. Any questions, get involved, and we should hopefully answer them yeah, in our next show. I think so, folks. I mean, this, the whole business about this is you guys can give your feedback as well in the comments. You know, you guys might have some knowledge which we've not got, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, have a discussion about some of the topics. Um, so yeah, hope that helps and uh, see you next time on the EMBN Tech Clinic.